to everyone and thank you Chloe 3D for inviting me to this uh, for this opportunity. I'm Chris Lanovic and uh, I uh, work at Design School Colling in Denmark. We are a university. So um, I'll just, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is a short introduction to me and my role and to the university. I'll tell you about how we started the journey and also how we've developed from there and how we're using it. I am an educator and have been for many years. I'm a fashion designer myself by education, and I am the current manager of the fashion program at the design school. Um, I have taught, I think, virtually all aspects of uh, fashion design and have always myself been interested in uh, digital solutions. And uh, then when I was... Um, four or five years ago, I asked about looking into this together with a, a former colleague. Um, I found it was really interesting. So four years ago, I started my journey with the, uh, at the first um, academy education at the Clothe 3D in Munich. And, um, and from then on started um, the project. The Design School Culling, it's a artistic based design university. And uh, it's very much a hands-on approach. We have workshops where the students can sketch. They can sketch 2D, 3D, digitally. They uh, search for inspiration, literature, and they get to understand their, the end users through um, data gathering and analysis. We have for more than 20 years had a focus on sustainability. And uh, we strive to be for the students to be making a meaningful, responsible, and creative design that um, last more than a season. So the start of the journey, at first I set up a pilot project. I needed to understand uh, how to teach uh, Chloe 3D since it was a new thing to the school. And uh, my aim of this was to find out how the students uh, would use it in the design process, how they would use it creatively, and how they would use it for prototyping. And, and then also how it perhaps, because I had this idea, it was really going to help some of the students to whom going from a 2D pattern to 3D um, was a difficulty, had a difficulty understanding it, that it could actually help them as well. So uh, I did an extra curricular course. It, were, it was running six lessons, one and a half hour each. They had a questionnaire first. And I used flipped learning, which is um, where the students have to watch some of the uh, BiClo 3D to provided tutorials you find online, because then I knew we had a different starting point and I didn't have to go over that. We had very little time, as you can see. And um, uh, this is just a, a brief um, uh, photo of one of the, uh, the questionnaires I did. So I, I needed to know because I did this at the, uh, at the master program um, where we have students from more than 30 countries. So I don't know their background from a bachelor background. So I wanted to know what it was like, what, how, what they used to digital programs. How did they usually do the pattern construction? Do they do pattern construction and so on? So I had them uh, fill in the questionnaire and also fill in how do you communicate uh, your drawing? So if it was for a production thing. This gave me an idea of what uh, level I could start out at. Um, then after having done this uh, introduction, I gathered all my information. I, I found out uh, every, every day I would make sure at the end of the day, I would sure I would um, get some feedback. So I knew how to adjust for the next lesson that was planned, but how I could adjust it and uh, also register how they responded to it. So once I had all this information, I, um, I started the first course uh, of where it was implemented and I had a collaboration on this one here with uh, Clothe 3D in uh, Munich with then Manuel Hallemeyer came and, and uh, taught the first class, which allowed me to sit back and just register how do they respond how do they work how does uh and also of course as an assistant help out uh when they got stuck um this was done uh as a collaboration where we made a video about how the school implemented uh clothes 3d and it's you find it under the 
the website on the user stories. This was extremely valuable for me to have this time to just be looking over uh, Manuel's uh, shoulder, but also looking at all the students to see how they reacted. So uh, in this course, this is a called collection production and where um, there are different, different um, teaching methods and the teaching methods I was taught myself at Clothe3D on the course is what I have called the linear. You start by, this is the, so, this is the uh, interface, this is the gizmo, this is how you use it, and you, you add to the steps all the time. That way of teaching is requires that the, uh, the student already know something about pattern making, they know something about draping, they know something about material and hand. So since I'm was going to teach this at the second year where they don't have all the knowledge, but they're still learning. I, um, I shaped this into be a more a contextual. That means that what they really needed to learn here was how to make a pair of trousers, because this is what they do in this very um, module. They learn how to make trousers and of course the other things, but this is focused on that. So it becomes very contextual. So we started out with teaching them how to everything regarding trousers. Um, this is in order to scaffold their education, to not make it overwhelming, to make it something they can see themselves developing in ooh, the next level, or oh, I can do this and be curious as well. So this as well uh, will uh, support their self-efficacy in finding out more, finding YouTube um, tutorials or whatever, or asking around. So this was an example of how the layout was in the program. And this, as you can see, is the, uh, the rendering and the actual uh, clothes on the right hand side. Uh, done by a student who never worked in the program before this module. Then uh, this here shows up. So what I so this was as part of this startup and implementing Clothe 3D, it had to be recognizable into how we already teach uh, at the school. So uh, at the uh, at the school, we they always learn how to draft a skirt. And at, you have to remember, this is actually four years ago, right? So there weren't all that, there were tutorials, but there weren't all that many and not necessarily on how to draft a skirt. So some of these things you see I've made videos for is because it was back then and I had to sort of um, make the videos myself. So I made a video of how to draw, draft a skirt so the students could see it, they could see it either digitally or they could see me doing it in class uh, together with them in, in what we now would call the analog way or the classic way. The same, I made a video for how to develop a pattern because that is what we do the most. We don't have all the time in the world to, to make a pattern from scratch. So what we do, we have the, the, the block patterns and we develop on, on top of this. And this is a video on how to develop uh, from a skirt into trousers. Again, this was a, a course on trousers, but to make them understand how to build the crotch and that three-dimensional area we, extra we need for uh, trousers. The same went for, I showed how to develop a pair of jeans on top of a pair of trousers. I do it, as you can see, you have the two avatars for the, to compare the, what is considered a nice fit on a pair of ordinary trousers and what is considered a nice fit for a pair of jeans that needs to have a bit more roomy baggy-ness uh, to the rear part. I put the, uh, as you can see, I have the new pattern on top so the students can understand all the time what the changes were and how the, uh, this, this uh, drop here or the, the tilt of the center back will give more room and more bagginess here. This is all to be in alignment with how we teach at the school already as it is. Uh, here I just used, I made a pattern of brain and bias. Again, for the students to understand uh, what it means. And, and uh, then there, will be, there were examples of well, what, how it drapes when it's on the bias. So after this, I found out these were like my seven steps of, um, of how to uh, implement. This is, we are doing it really short here because I want to show you some, some um, other methods as well. But the pilot part, find the group of students, get to understand them, test them, test yourself. I did the survey before 
And I also did a survey after I planned all the course, all the classes for the course, got the daily feedback so I can just adjust for the next one. Uh, create own material so it actually matches the kind of education you have and how you already teach it because seamlessly from the digital to uh, analog. And then it has to be uh, relevant and contextual so they understand why am I doing this now. Uh, so they, uh, because some students will find, uh, some students take to digital solutions like um, a Dr. Walter, others will be a bit sort of more, um, well, won't jump in just like that. So make it understandable and for them all the time why we do it. And then repeat. So it's, this is just an ongoing process. You just do it every time you start a new course, you know, uh, who you're going to teach and uh, how you're going to teach them. Um, I would like to uh, show you a couple of examples now. This is from the Bachelor of Second Year. They, uh, so in the beginning, they were taught first at uh, the second year on the fourth semester. But I soon realized that I would be really great if they, the sooner they got started. So we moved it, we moved the start to the third semester in digital tools. And it became, and this is also on the contextual uh, method, where in this case, what they learn is outerware. And all the all the tools from the huge toolbox of Clothes 3D, we use the tools regarding how to make patterns and pattern development regarding everything you need to know for making an outer piece of outerwear. There might be things we don't go through, we might not go through pleats, we might not go through uh, some of the other things, but then if enough wanted, we just adjust it uh, throughout the class. So the classes are planned, but always with a bit of elastic band of going, okay, the students now want to know more about this and that, stop everyone and show it or um, show the individual student. <clears throat> These are examples from second year fashion. And, uh, and some really take it that here we have a student who didn't know uh, much about um, pattern making, pattern construction, but to whom the program have, have helped, has helped immensely for him to understand. And he's quickly made it just giant leaps that uh, would have taken him an awful long time had it been uh, the classic way. So um, this is uh, from the master students first year skills. And you can see I've, I've, uh, I've called this the linear method because now I've had, when dealing with the master students, you have students who already know about how to make pattern pants. They know about materials, they know about drape, they know all these things. So you can, with all that knowledge in mind, they can go from the from start. This is the, this is the interface. These are the things you can use and build it up. And then they will see possibilities themselves. But they, you need to know that much before you can see the possibilities. And this is why at the skills workshop, we uh, can, can use the linear method. The skills workshop here is for uh, fashion, textile, and uh, accessory students. So it's very complex. And uh, what they do throughout their, uh, this is a textile student. So what they do throughout this uh, workshop is that they um, they uh, make the thing in uh, Clothe 3D, they plot it out, they make it for real, test it out, go back, do adjustments, do changes, change materials, whatever. But it's the constant, admittedly, this one here wasn't made for real, but the other ones are constant in and out of digital and analog uh, clothes making or, or bag making, and then um, you refined it in close 3D. This here is uh, was only made digitally, and this is an example of also how um, some students choose to use uh, close 3D as a um, as a just only digital fashion because it uh, set you free of um, of all the restrictions that the real world can have. This is from our program that's called Play. So the uh, so after this, I thought, no, we've had uh, we've had it implemented on the fourth semester. We had it implemented on the third semester. I need to start them sooner. But on the first year of bachelor, they do they have very little knowledge on draping and pattern making and materials. They've just started out. They've done a lot of uh, drawing, and here we're doing colonization. But I thought, oh, okay, why don't we just do what I have called the hack method? We just go 
straight in and make like a surgical intervention into the program and say, you are provided with uh, um, something to wear on the torso and uh, you have to use what you have made in the color and visualization. And then you get very few tools. You get to know how to do cotton sew, you need you know, on how to make, um, um, add the materials and very few, very few other tools. So everything else is left behind and they're just a jump in. You don't know much, just try and do something. And um, I, I must say, I was very chuffed to see they were just like, okay, we'll do that. And then they just went with it and, uh, and did their things. And sometimes they uh, pushed the computers a bit too much because for this very, uh, thing here with the puff, they were allowed to go, I think put in like um, 80 was the max number, they put in 500 and the computers were glowing <laughs> hot, but um, um, but they, they really got to this, this again, this is uh, this, a student who's, they have four days for it all. And this is perhaps done in the second day. They just take it, um, uh, they take it and run with it and have fun. They're just, it, it's a very intuitive way of doing it. And it's, it's great to see what they come up with. They use it for just playing. Another student here just uh, trying out, also fashion. Again, fashion trying to see what, what if I place the print? What if I scale the print? What do you, does that mean for my, uh, my final outcome? And again, this course here is both for fashion and textile, again, it's complex, but because we keep it so tight and we provide here, like we provide the curtains, we provide the clothes for them. They don't have to make it themselves. They can just start playing and dragging and, and scaling and trying materials out. So here we have a textile students trying scaling. And again, here, uh, the same patterns in various sizes and with, uh, and on this uh, coat on the right in, uh, in velvet. And for how do I, if it's an all over, if I end out to be an all over uh, print. Then we also have students that go, oh, okay. Uh, uh, this student here always works like this. Um, he tests and try and, and if this is closed, what can I then, this, if this is shaped for body, I could also say, how could I make shapes for body using clothes 3D? And he uh, just uh, takes it to an, a different level, another level, and plays around with textures and, as you can see, shine and shapes and just, uh, um, yeah, work actually exactly like he does if he's working uh, physically with his stuff. Um, and, uh, but of course, this will give him a, a fast in, uh, information on could this work because you're building this in a physical world, it's gonna take you much, much longer. So he was able to play around here. Um, then this is, uh, so these were the three methods and I'm just gonna show you two pro uh, projects and how the students then choose to use uh, uh, Clothe 3D themselves. They just go because it's a, um, a very good uh, tool for them. So we have this uh, module called Design for Change where the students go through uh, they learn about the past, they have about present, and then they uh, uh, do a future project on how can we work in a more sustainable way? What can we take from the past and use for now? Uh, or what can we take and, uh, and use in the future? And in this case, it was, uh, this was, uh, it's always a group work between fashion and textiles. And they had this idea, why don't we make basic garments? And then if we have, robotic yarn woven or knitted into the material, we can, and this is speculative design, it's not doable yet, but what if it was? And um, so this they do, and then, then, then they, they say, so what if we were to weave or knit uh, these robotic yarns into materials, and then we, through an app, could change the uh, actual um, style, so we wouldn't have to have many styles and we could swap and we could uh, have a basic one like this in knit. And it could look something like this regarding whether you were a man or woman or where, uh, gender fluid or whatever you wanted to uh, do with your um, 
your knitted garment. And then you could, via the app, make it go back to the basic again. Then we have uh, another um, example of how the students use it. They wanted to make, again, this was for the same course and for the future part, they wanted to make a shelter that you could wear. And they looked into uh, other kinds of shelters and tents. And um, they decided that they were gonna knit the whole thing and they chose the colors and they used, uh, they really went he heavy on the, uh, on the use of digital tools. And they also made these, they um, 3D printed these little uh, gathering things for their tent and what is holding on and putting their tent together and then had it printed themselves. And then um, they, they started out their whole uh, experimentation. What kind of shape do we want? They did that in a gravity sketch using a VR uh, virtual reality goggles. And then once they had the idea, they developed the whole pattern in uh, Clothe 3D to see how can this be done. Again, because this is something that could be a bit trickier to do uh, or take longer to do if you're doing it physically. And once they had this um, design, they went and knitted, and this is the, the shelter that you can have in there, the photo then knitted. And uh, it can be worn with or without the construction that makes it into a shelter. Then um, the, the, I'll show you, I'd like to show you a couple of uh, collection of production things we have on the fourth semester with BA2. This is the, um, this is from uh, this year where the, uh, where the student has uh, made um, uh, an outfit of um, three styles and has uh, first made, um, she was, uh, they're supposed to make, this is another thing that is very important to say, once introduced with Chloe 3D, it's very important that there is a delivery every time they have to, uh, they, they go into new models. It's very important to have one delivery so they keep using it. It's like, if they don't, it's use it or lose it. So in order to keep them practicing, keep remembering, developing their skills, they need to have a delivery. And in this one here, they have to have one delivery, but she, this student here chose to do all three uh, items for her outfit in a clothes 3D. And this, these are some of the tests and uh, visualizations she did on, on what it would look like, uh, the final outcome. And this is, uh, yeah, the final. Then there's also, I'd like to show you, because this is another example of how our students find Clove 3D very useful. So this, in this case here, the student wanted to, uh, she was gathering information on sizes because uh, there's something not really working in the way sizes are for clothes and people, it hardly fits anyone. So she wanted to show the different sizes of a, of a group. And instead of just having the numbers, um, this visualization shows it all in, yeah, with no words, we all understand tall, small, wider, narrower, longer legs, shorter legs, and so on. And she used, she made each of her, her, her group, uh, her survey group, she made them as an avatar. Uh, to represent their sizes. Uh, I would like to show you our, uh, one of our master students who chose to do use Clothe 3D for um, digital fashion only. So she made a collection made out of waste material from a Danish designer. Uh, so the garments he hadn't been able to sell, she had access to and she, uh, she scanned and she uh, remade the clothes uh, digitally, and this collection was only uh, digital. It's a couple of the examples. Uh, and she was in the program for Planet, which is the master program for sustainability. Yes, so our next step, sorry, that was a bit too, I was, I'll end here instead. So our next step, what we're looking into next is to, um, uh, implementing it further, having uh, also making it, uh, making use of Clo 3D together with, as we saw a bit in the um, Design for Change project with the tent and the shelter, 
to use other digital tools. So they'll be, they will have, end up with not only sort of I have skills, but actually a mindset, a digital mindset that will make them demand and ask, what can this do for me instead of thinking uh, that, uh, so they are above, okay, I want the program to do something for me instead of being a slave to the pro program. So they find their own new ways uh, within digital solutions, both for, yeah, in, including people for diversity, for a bit of a more, that could be a bit more of a democratic process in design. So you can invite your users into uh, the project also here. If this uh, student here would have liked to make it into real garments, you know, you could she could visualize it like this, and it could be an on-demand um, uh, sales. You only make it the moment people click and say yes. I do want this one here. So we're just trying to constantly extend the use of it and the and especially how we can use it in, in a sustainable way, uh, both within uh, prototyping, but also in the final uh, garment. I'd like to say thank you for your time. The project I did was all about how do we implement it? And therefore, of course, I was like revisiting what had happened and trying to sort of grasp, okay, how do I deliver this to others? My focus was with the with the uh, the education to constantly make sure that the students knew where they were at and mm -hmm. that I knew they that I wasn't asking too much. So I had the the approaches of the zone of development from the Vygotsky method, you know, make sure you don't ask too much and lose people. But again, you have to also ask so they can feel they're being challenged and and then also the uh, the methods of scaffolding. So you are all the time making sure that they don't feel alone, like you do as the implementer. Yeah. And 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 then it, it, it eventually also aiming for them to have self-efficacy. So they own this. They can go out themselves and learn more and look for things and feel that they um, they have some both skills, insights, knowledge, something mm -hmm. to grasp on, to build on, to so. But the actual the steps is like I was trying to I kept going how how can I deliver this and this how it's sort of, to me it seemed like they're like these steps that I can do again and again and again mm -hmm. um, and then as and as I said you know I, I also found out that it's, it's because you have to look at where what the where the students are at you have to have a different approach because you can't you cannot ask students on their uh, in their first year they just entered the school to know everything about draping and pattern making and textiles because then they didn't need to to enter in the first place so yeah. um it was the same steps i have to go through understand my students plan be flexible and um and so on yeah so so in that sense it did grow organically uh mm -hmm. i didn't set up the steps first i had to it, it was a bit trial error use and then um calling it yeah I have found that the best way to work with this is you're constantly in and out of both uh, digital pattern making and also uh, paper corrections or pattern making. Some students uh, will rather do their um, corrections or development uh, in the classic paper way and, and then go back. And because our students, they... Uh, they always question uh, what is shape for body and what should we do and how can I can I do this so they, it's it's very uh, experimental very creative shapes they come up with sometimes so what we do if they do that then sometimes you actually need to also have it in front of you to build up on on a dress mannequin and then if we do that then we have a big uh, scanner and we scan the patterns and then they uh, put the the physical patterns in and digitalize them like that so. So it's a constant uh, understanding both of what is the digital world and but you need the physical to really understand, mm -hmm. unless of course you want to go just for digital fashion, then it doesn't really mean, then it doesn't really matter. But the moment you want to make it somebody for somebody who, to wear, you need to at some point also plot it and, and make it physical. So we are, we're very much in and out of the pattern making uh, process in the very first, when, or in the first year, when in the so-called hacked method, we um, we don't really talk about pattern making that much. With we just allow them to go crazy and make what would be considered classical mistakes. 
but mm-hmm. it's more about playing and not feeling inhibited or anything, just running wild with it. The whole community around Clothe 3D and also all the materials provided by Clothe 3D has expanded so much over the four years since I started this. So there's everything to be found, but I still have I still have these, uh, the students still get these videos so they can see because this is the way they will be taught. Uh, because in the first year they're taught classically on paper. Mm-hmm. And then when they go into uh, 3D, they say, okay, this is the same way. This is how we'll do it if it was 3D. But other, otherwise, no, I don't, I don't make any material anymore. It's not necessary. It's, there's so much out there. And, and even if, even if they're, is anything missing? I can today do it in no time because I too have grown and learned how to quickly. You just do it also more informally. Before I was more formal. This is educational. You just you know you just show it to a student while you record the screen and hey you got your video going. So uh, but we, there's so many tutorials out there. So it's super easy. The teachers provide those, uh, in this case, these curtains and uh, for, for, the, um, for the master skills where you saw some bags that was together with the company that had provided a pattern already for because they wanted that bag developed, but it was very sort of strict. It had to be that bag. But otherwise, uh, for, for, the, um, for the first year, we provide them with, um, we have not all of our block patterns, but we are working towards having all our block patterns digitalized, but we have a lot of uh, block patterns digitalized and we have also, uh, um, yeah, we can share you, as uh, a industry, uh, that company, they also have some uh, shared um, things set out of a, also very experimental um, pattern construction and development. So. So we, we we share it like that and then take it from there and they can they can do their own or yeah. How many finished garments? That depends on the uh, that to me would definitely depend on the length of the module you're teaching, right? So have you got a short you uh I mean like okay, so in the uh so the master class that goes for two weeks where they are really learning the program in a linear deep way, uh, they only have to provide one final outfit, right? So they're just, and not actually not even final, they're providing a 12 just to show that the fit and everything works Mm -hmm. because they don't have more time because focus is on the digital version, on the rendering, on understanding lights and and materials uh, for the rendering. Whereas with the, on the second year where we have the concept and digital tools, and the production collection production, they have to make three styles in collection production, but only one has to be in Chloe 3D. Mm-hmm. But it depends on how long. So the master class is only master master class workshop is only two weeks, whereas the collection production is nine weeks and more time to experiment, develop, and so on. Yes, so we had we used to uh, teach uh, Gerber. Um, we don't do it anymore. We just see no uh, need for it. The thing is that the, uh, the 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 competence profile of our student is not to actually be the the pattern makers. They just know how to make patterns in order to be able to be creative within pattern making. But we do have Gerber files that we have imported into. Uh, to um to close 3d and use and uh yeah any files it could be it, i find it easy to in, even draw up a file in uh, adobe illustrator if that's what you prefer to do you could do that as well and incorporate it or trace it or so um so we don't use those uh, programs uh, we don't use the 2d program anymore the hacked method is in the first year and why why we do it the way we do is because they at this point do not know very much about pattern making or draping or um, materials and so on hand how it it, it drapes and all so what we do is we we provide them with uh, we have 
fashion and textile students together. So the textile students, for them, it's very much about scaling the, the prints they made themselves, choosing a fabric, see how what happens to it. And they do this on curtains or clothes. And we provide those curtains and we provide the clothes for them as well. And for the um, for the students on the in the fashion, it's about trying to resemble something they have been drawing in that mo module. That's called, they have this module called um, color and visualization. And then they try to transform one of, one of the sketches into a uh, design. But we only introduce them to very few tools. We think that could set them free instead of being overwhelmed with all the possibilities. So you just simply put the, the, we had cardboard pattern, it could also be paper. You put this into the scanner and then you have your, um, your, your scan. And then what we do is we simply trace it uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the right tools for that, whether it's internal lines or whether it's the polygon mm -hmm. um, pattern making. Uh, so we do it like that. And it also um, kind of, uh, in that respect also shows the student they could use any kind of shape could be used. It doesn't have to be uh, a block pattern. And then, yes, we plot. We have a plotter. And yes, we plot it directly from uh, from um, from Clo. In the beginning, we would plot it through Gerber, actually. But but uh, there's no need for that anymore. Yes, we've had a couple, as I mentioned, the one called Simona. She, she worked with this, uh, with this company. And we've also uh, another of our student, uh, who, uh, Emil Ustergaard, who really took to like a Dr. Water, who came. I'll just uh, elaborate a little bit on him because he came to the master uh, program with not a traditional uh, fashion background, but a lot of knowledge from, from his, but he had never made patterns. And uh, this program really set him free to make a whole lot of things and questioning how can I communicate a uh, clothes that is made um, digitally how can I communicate with it um, so people understand what it is and he uh, worked with a couple of companies uh, to try and Manteco fabric um, mill in Italy and with the A industry uh, as a collaborating partner to to co communicate the um, uh, to, to communicate the ideas how do we how do we make people to understand in the physical world what they're seeing digitally? How do you do that translation? So there are definitely students on the master level who've done that, uh, who also use it again as a tool to, uh, to show uh, companies, how can we make a modular uh, collection? Uh, how can we make sustainable solutions? Yeah. Very much so. As for the, as for the bachelor pilot part of the program, uh, the, the main linked to industry has been that uh, on the uh, fifth semester that our students go on an internship and uh, there have been a few of students who have in their internship had the reverse role instead of being, they, they do learn from the, the, their internship, but they also teach. We have this huge, huge thing going on and pr producers and designers and how do we link in like that, but, mm -hmm. but showing the example of how it works, then you can start understanding, okay, if I see this, then we could start here with a smaller part, you know, just few items and then build it instead of thinking you have to change everything overnight, which is impossible to do.